haven't seen Biggin since Wednesday, and I was I was needing a fix. <coughs> I'll probably skip somebody, but it's good to see James and Madeline here this morning. All the way from Michigan. Good to have Coke. Coke. There you are. Now I want you to know that he got his name Coke back before. He got his name Coke when it was the drink instead of the other stuff. Uh, Pam, 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 Pam. There you are. Pam, we missed you. Pam's back from the hospital and been recuperating at home. It's good to have her. And Bernadette's been sick for quite some time and still has something, but we're glad to see her. Today, at Signature Healthcare in Pikeville at 2.30, we're going to be having singing and preaching, and Brother Ed, who's been sick, says he probably won't be able to lead singing. So keep that in mind, song leaders. We need you today. 2.30 at Signature Health care. Anybody in here ever read the Scarlet Letter? Anybody? Novel written in 1850 by Nathaniel Hawthorne. In the novel, novel, a woman by the name of Hester Prynne conceived a daughter outside of marriage. And as a result, the community got together and they forced her after other punishment, to go the rest of her life with a scarlet letter, remember? On her clothing. Remember what the letter was? Letter A. And A stood for adulteress. And so she was forced to wear this letter as punishment for the rest of her life. Turns out, you remember who was guilty? Who the daddy was? The village preacher was the daddy. And he, on his chest, had an A placed there and wore it the rest of his life, but he kept it covered up by his clothing so nobody knew that he was also guilty. You know, scarlet is a brilliant red collar, easily seen by everybody except those who are colorblind to that particular shade of of red. If you're wondering exactly what scarlet looks like, you remember the Canadian Mounted Police? Well, their uniforms are scarlet in color. Considered to be a beautiful color, used extensively in the trimmings in the Old Testament of the temple, along with the colors blue and purple. And imagine blue and purple and scarlet was the collarings that were used inside the temple. It was beautiful, beautiful. The scarlet, the scarlet collar, believe it or not, in pre-medieval times was derived from an insect called the Kermes insect. And this Kermes insect would feed upon the sap of a tree that was known as the Kermes oak tree, a tree only found in the Mediterranean Region. They would collect the insect, they would dry the insect, they would crush the insect, and then they would use the powder left behind to dye fabrics. And only the rich could afford to wear garments that were collared in scarlet. Well, since the collar scarlet is hard to miss, it's no wonder that God, through Isaiah the prophet in the long ago, use this color to describe our sins. It's in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. We're able to read the prophet speaking God's words. He says, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wolves. We got a song in our songbooks 
that says that very thing. It's on page number... It's in here. 683. Get your songbook. 683. <clears throat> 683. 683. Sing the first verse. Anybody know it? Sing it anyway. <laughs> Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Though your sins be as scarlet, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They shall be as white as snow. That's a pretty song to learn. Isaiah the prophet says, though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Now, although the book of Isaiah speaks a whole lot about the Jesus to come, the Messiah to come, and how He's going to be giving of Himself suffering for all of mankind, the book of Isaiah was also written as a warning. It was written as a warning for Israel to turn away from their evil ways and come back to the God who loves them and is willing to forgive them. Without repentance, Israel is going to be carried into bondage. Without repentance, Judah is going to be carried into bondage. And since we know that both of these, the northern tribes and the southern tribes, were all carried into bondage, what does that tell us? They didn't repent. They didn't change. But God tried to change His erring people. Isn't it amazing that although man does not always seek God, God always, always, always seeks man. It was God who took the initiative to call Abraham in the long ago and make of him the father of a great nation. It was God who chose Moses to lead the suffering nation of Israel out of their Egyptian bondage to that wonderful land flowing of milk and honey which He had promised to them. It was God who continually called for His people to come back to Him whenever they would leave Him. It was God who in the form of Jesus the Messiah came to redeem man upon earth from the sin under which he had been serving. Israel had forsaken God. And God said through Isaiah, the prophet, all hope is not lost. Though your sins stick out like a sore thumb, though they be as scarlet, they can be made white as snow. God says, I'll forgive you. But I'll forgive you on the condition that you come back to me. You remember the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 11, 28, 29, 30? Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavily laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. You remember that verse that we read from Isaiah? God through Isaiah the prophet said to Israel, let us reason together, saith the Lord. In other words, God says to Israel, I want you to think this over. I want you to use your brains. 
I want you to come back to me because you consider it to be the right thing to do. You know, if we die today without coming in contact with the blood of Jesus, without having our sins washed away, then we're eternally doomed. What does reasoning tell you? Reasoning tells you this is what you ought to do. Stay away from that place of eternal punishment. The mind of man should tell us that the reasonable thing to do in this instance is to avoid such a place by becoming a child of the Most High God. Next, God makes a promise. And that promise is, He says, if Israel will come back to God, then God will turn those scarlet sins that stick out like a sore thumb that are plain as they can be to the eyes of Almighty God. He says, I will turn them into a whiteness like the virgin snow. Just like Saul of Tarsus was told in Acts 22.16 when the preacher said, Why tarriest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sin. Get rid of those sins. Make them so they're not there anymore. Cleaner than the whitest sheets that you ladies are able to get out of the washer after you've cleaned them. In the days that John lived, John the Apostle of Love lived, the greatest enemy of the Lord's church outside of Satan himself was the Roman Empire. It was considered to be undefeatable considered to be unequal in glory and riches and power. Members of the church were often persecuted to the death by this empire. That's why we're able to read in the Lord's message to the church at Smyrna, found in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, Jesus says, Be thou faithful unto death. Unto death there means even if it means death. Be thou faithful even if it means death and I will give thee a crown of life. Why would he write that way? Well, because the Christians were being persecuted to the death. The Roman Empire of John's time is described in Revelation 17 as a woman who was a whore who rode upon a beast. I want you to notice these words found in Revelation 17, 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet collar and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Later on in that same chapter, we're going to see that the beast falls and the woman also falls. They are destroyed. But during the days of John, the empire of Rome was in its glory persecuting the very children of the Almighty and is described as wearing scarlet, being rich and powerful, thinking itself to be lasting forever. You know what happens though when we think we're so great? God says in 1 Corinthians 10, the Christians in Corinth are, giving, are being given warnings in this chapter. These Christians in Corinth are being reminded of what took place in the Old Testament times and the punishment that had been meted out to the Israelites when, although they considered themselves to be God's chosen, they sinned against God. And when they sinned against God, God punished them for their disobedience. And so it is that Paul says to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 10:11. This record of the disobedience and punishment that was given to the Israelites in the Old Testament time was given to us for an example so we could learn from their mistakes. And Paul says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Rome thought we'll never fall. God says, Take heed lest ye fall. There's not a one of them. I don't care who it is except for the babies. I don't care who it is except for the babies that can sit back smugly and think that there's not the possibility of us failing spiritually. Even the great Apostle Paul wrote these words in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 27. He said, but I keep under my body 
And I bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I've preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. It's no wonder that he wrote as he did in Romans 7. In Romans chapter 7, Paul begins to talk about grace. He says things like this. He says, the things that I know I should do, I don't. And the things that I know I shouldn't do, sometimes I do. And then he concludes that idea by writing in Romans chapter 7 and verse 24. He says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And then he gives answer to it in the very next verse. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul says, I'm not so foolish as to think I never commit sin, but I'm thankful for the soul redeeming power of the blood of the Lamb of God. Paul says, I know I can fall. Well, the Roman Empire thought it would never fall. Dressed in scarlet, exhibiting great wealth and power, it thought that it was invincible. But God had other plans, and it fell. It's in the book of Joshua that we read about a scarlet thread saving an entire family. Regular Bible students know this story well. While still on the east side of the Jordan River, preparing to enter that wonderful promised land, the nation of Israel, now under the leadership of Joshua, for Moses has died, is ready to take over that land flowing with milk and honey. And Joshua sends <clears throat> two spies over to the city of Jericho so that they could spy the land out. And when they get there, they go to the home of Rahab. Word gets to the king of Jericho that there are spies that have entered his city and have ended up at the home of Rahab. And so the king goes to the home of Rahab looking for these spies. Rahab hides the spies. And she tells the king that the men have already left. They're already gone. And so you, king, and those with you ought to follow them and see if you can catch them. And so the king and those with him head towards the Jordan River in order to attempt to overtake the spies. But Rahab had hid those spies under stalks of flax upon the roof of her house. After the king leaves, Rahab tells the spies she knows God's with the nation of Israel. She had heard how the Lord had dried up the waters of a Red Sea for him. She had heard how Israel had utterly defeated two kings on the eastern side of the Jordan River. And as a result, Rahab wants to make a deal with those two spies and also with the nation of Israel. Since she had saved the spies from certain death, she asked that she and her family be saved when Israel invades Jericho. It so happens that Rahab's house was a part of the town wall of Jericho and Rahab takes a scarlet thread and lets these two spies all the way down to the ground. Now the word thread here is not like the thread that we're used to. It's not like sewing thread. The word thread there means cord or line or string. She was told by the spies to take that scarlet thread with which they had reached safety and hang it in the window of her house. And whoever is in that house when Israel invades Jericho, they, the Israel will see that scarlet thread and they will spare whoever is there. Rahab and her family are spared. In fact, Rahab ends up being in the very lineage. Anybody know of who? Jesus. The very lineage of our Messiah, Jesus. In Matthew 1 and verse 5, she's referred to as Rahab, which is the same word as Rahab. Well, inasmuch as a scarlet thread was used to save the lives of the spies, it's commonly taught and believed that the redness of the cord that the spies used to escape danger really represents the blood of Jesus that was going to be shed in centuries to come to offer salvation to the entire human race. So the blood of Jesus today 
can be that scarlet thread that is used to save man from the soul-condemning sin which he's committed. I want us to look at some New Testament passages explaining the blood of Jesus and salvation together. It was on the Thursday evening, just one day prior to the crucifixion of our Lord. Jesus meets with His apostles and institutes the Lord's Supper. That memorial we partake of every Sunday to remember the body and the, the blood of the Messiah, both of which were given for us. It was during this institution of the communion that Jesus gave the cup to the apostles and He said that which is recorded in Matthew 26, verse 28. Jesus said, For this is My blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now note, note, Jesus said, My blood will be shed for the remission of sins. His blood was not shed because sins were already forgiven, was it? Jesus shed His blood so sins could be forgiven. Not because they already had. Now, let me keep your attention. It's in the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. There the Apostle Peter on that wonderful day of Pentecost preaches to those who had been guilty of putting the very Son of God to death. And they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do when they found out that they were guilty of this horrible crime? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. I did a study in the Greek language. And I found out that when Jesus said, This is my blood shed for the remission of sins, and where Peter preached in Acts 2.38, that we are to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, they're identical. The same Greek words, perfectly identical, are used in each passage. Therefore, let's come to the conclusion that the meaning would be the same in each passage. Peter does not say be, repent and be baptized because your sins have already been forgiven. But rather, he's saying, repent and be baptized so your sins can be forgiven. To the elders from the congregation at Ephesus, the Apostle Paul writes in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, he says, take heed therefore unto yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which He hath purchased with His own blood. The church has been bought by the blood of Jesus. The church, the redeemed, the saved, been bought with the blood of our Lord. In the book of Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, we're able to read, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. 1 John chapter 1 verse 7, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. We read in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto Him that loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. Romans 5, 9 says you're justified by the blood. Today, today can be the very day that you're saved by that scarlet thread. That scarlet thread we call the blood of the Lamb take advantage of that which took place upon that old rugged cross. Let the blood of Jesus wash away your sins this very day. Be baptized for the same reason that Jesus shed His blood for the remission of sins. Today, if you're here and you're not a child of God, make this the day. If you're here and you're an erring child of God, make this the day you come home. Either case, won't you respond? Won't you come forward while we stand and while we sing? Careless of why will you linger wandering from the fold of God? Hear ye not the invitation of oh, prepare to meet thy God. Careless soul, oh, we the warning.
page 359 we'll sing the first verse while the brother come forward to prayer for our obedient service Jesus keep me near the cross there's a precious fountain free to all the This is such a special time, the way it is a special time, and the purpose we're here today is to remember the scene on the cross where our loving Savior was willing to go and hang and suffer and die for the sins of each and every one of us and for the world. So our thoughts need to be on that at this time. I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, 23rd verse, beginning, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me after the same manner also he took the cup and when he had supped saying this cup is the new testament in my blood this do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Let us give thanks. Our loving Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves before your throne of grace and mercy, Father, asking your blessing upon this bread which represents the broken body of your son and our savior jesus christ father father ask that you bless it and bless those that are about to partake of it in christ's name amen <clears throat> 